to this great message. I know all of you love liberty, and so you certainly want to become more efficient at speaking the language of liberty. So I'm just going to get uh, right into this and, and start talking about the significance about uh, using the right words and doing so with the proper tone and the proper spirit. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I'm sure that those words ring just as true to you as they do to me, and as they have to millions of Americans since they were penned by Thomas Jefferson in 1776, or as true to Jefferson himself when he read the words of John Locke penned almost 100 years earlier. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, and reason, which is that law, teaches all mankind that being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. Now, in that quote from John Locke, you hear the similarity to the law of nature and of nature's God. You hear self-evident truths, or all men are created equal, and the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and property. Now, why is it that Jefferson and Locke sound the same? Because they are the same. Because they both declare fundamental principles of liberty, and because John Locke and Thomas Jefferson both knew how to speak the language of liberty. Now, how is it that these two individuals, divided by a span of 100 years, came to speak the same language of liberty? Now, a crude interpretation of history would lead one to simply state, Thomas Jefferson read Locke and copied him. Now, while this is true, it misses a deeper understanding of Thomas Jefferson and his life's work. These principles are interwoven throughout Jefferson's public speeches and private letters. It is clear that he did more than just simply copy Locke. He studied the philosophers of freedom. He studied many of them throughout history. He sifted out the self-evident natural law principles. He studied them, he lived them, he taught them, and then he strived to implement them. They became part of him. They became second nature to him. Now, when Jefferson was asked towards the end of his life, where he got the Declaration of Independence, the source for the language in the Declaration. A lot of people at the time were, uh, people were accusing him of stealing it from George Mason's Virginia Declaration of Rights or getting it from this source or that source. So toward the end of his life, Jefferson said, neither aiming at originality of principle or sentiment, nor yet copied from any particular and previous writing, it was intended to be an expression of the American mind and to give that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. Now, as you speak to friends and family, that message from Jefferson can really help you to make sure that you're doing so with the expression of the American mind or the expression of those who you're talking to, the mind of those who you're talking to, and to do so in the proper tone and the proper spirit called for by the occasion. As you try to speak to, to friends and family, and you certainly have been used to this, I'm sure, um, you try to talk to them about the importance of defending their freedom or going out and fighting for their freedom. How often do you get tongue-tied and find it difficult to express what's in your mind? Or you might easily explain the logic of your case, but leave your audience unmoved and uninterested because you failed to inspire them. Now, wouldn't you love to be a Thomas Jefferson? and to be able to speak the language of liberty? Well, I believe you can. You can learn to speak the language of liberty. The words we use and how we say them are very important. Now, what we're going to do this evening is, is I'm going to split this up into a couple of parts. The first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about Tea Party Patriots' new messaging. Um, we have some great phrases that have been developed over the last year or so, and. Uh, and, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to come back into speaking the language of liberty and, and how that new messaging uh, does that and some of the pointers and things, some of the tips that I can give you for speaking the language of liberty. So first I want to talk a little bit about Tea Party Patriots. Pursue your American dream, a message that works. 
Now, five years after the Tea Party movement started, our values haven't changed. Fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. Now, the information that I'm going to go through this evening uh, for the next few minutes, you can actually find more detail about this information on our website. If you go to teapartypatriots.org, and right there on, on the top, you'll see uh, a number of options. And so you'll click on Take Action. And then once you click on Take Action, now you don't want to do this now. Just make a note of it. And you can do this later when you want to learn a little bit more. And then uh, next, you'll click on Resources. And that will bring you to a number of options. And there you'll want to click on Training. So Take, ac take Action, Resources, and Training. Now that's going to bring you to a page that will have a number of videos on it. Now the videos that I want to bring to your attention are video number two. That's Jenny Beth Martin. And she's going to share a little bit about the American Dream uh, message. Now some of my words tonight are going to actually be taken directly from that video. And then if you want to learn a little bit more in depth about some of the polling we did and, uh, and some of the uh, responses from those polls and some of those numbers and things, then you want to look at video number eight, where you'll get more information on that. But suffice it uh, at this time, to, I'm just going to kind of briefly go through some of the content that are on those two videos. And then at a later time, you can go and check, take a look at those videos yourself. So fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. Boy, those words are a mouthful. And their concepts can be hard to explain. Now, our supporters and local coordinators and leaders around the country asked us to develop a new way of spreading the word, a better way to talk the talk. And it all starts with our new Tea Party Patriots theme, Pursue Your American Dream. It's simple, yet powerful. And while it can mean millions of different things to millions of different people, the basic idea is the same for everyone. Every American dream is unique, and every American deserves the freedom to pursue their version of it. We created this new theme after input from uh, many of our local leaders and, and our supporters. When we took your ideas to a broad co cross-section of Americans, we asked them what freedom meant. The overwhelming response was the ability to work hard, keep more of what they earned, and the right to live how they want as long as it does not infringe on the rights of others. In short, pursue your American dream. Now that's the first thing you'll see as you see underneath our logo there on our new website, Pursue Your American Dream. And it's very powerful and it's very precise uh, along with much other information on the website and other phrases and things that you can use. Now, to give you kind of an idea of some of the polling that, that gave us uh, this result of the American dream, when we asked people what the, the, the phrase the American dream meant to them, this was the result. <clears throat> the overall majority said it simply meant freedom. Next, people said opportunity. And next, they said to work hard and be rewarded. Now, this is great news for, for those of us who are freedom, liberty-loving people who want limited government and uh, who want to be as free as possible, because that's, that's what the majority of the people think of when they think of the American dream. You'll notice down toward the bottom of, this, of the results in this poll, you'll see economic security and upward mobility and, and those types of phrases that are normally associated with... Uh, with more socialist-minded principles. So it's good news for us that when people talk about the American dream, they're not talking about handouts. They're talking about freedom, opportunity, the op and then the ability to work hard and be rewarded for that work. Now, one thing that was a little depressing with the, the polling that we took was that people don't believe that the American dream as, is as achievable as it was for their parents. You'll notice here. Um, that overall, the average in the far left on that chart, 66% of Americans said that it's less achievable today than it was when our parents were our age. Now, I want to kind of show you and point out the different categories here on these charts, because you'll see a number of charts this evening as we go through this. 
you'll see on the far left there is the average. So that's just your average American, the average uh, number of people that were polled there. The next one are self-identified liberals. Most often self-identified liberals are usually quite extreme left. Um, they usually will be people who are, who are much more socialist minded. Moderates tend to lean a little bit more to the, to the left. Uh, and conservatives next. And then you have the GOP, Democrats, independents tend to lean a little bit more to the right. And then you'll see Tea Party favorite. These are people who agree with uh, Tea Party patriots, or at least as associate themselves and align themselves with Tea Party patriots. And then there on the far right, you'll see people who have no opinion of Tea Party patriots. Uh, and so th that kind of just gives you an idea of who's who on that chart, because I'm not going to go through numbers for each category for each chart. So right underneath our new theme is an example of what you'll see with some of this new messaging. What does Tea Party Patriots stand for? Now there's a ready answer. Tea Party Patriot stands for every American and is home to millions who have come together to pursue the American dream and to keep that dream alive for their children and grandchildren. Now, who could argue with that? And that's just the point. You might be uh, used to answering the question, what does Tea Party stand for? And you might say, fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets. Well, we've just made it easier to understand and taken the wind out of any opposition sales, all in one sentence, pursue your American dream. We also now have a clear vision of what America stands for. With your help, we've developed a simple yet impactful vision statement. We envision a nation where personal freedom is cherished and where all Americans are treated equally, assuring our ability to pursue the American dream. Now, personal freedom and equal treatment for all Americans, that's, what we all, that's all we're really asking for. It doesn't matter what group you belong to, or what views you hold, or whom you vote for, what causes you donate to, or what title you have. Equality and personal freedom is something we as Americans cherish. Now, as part of that freedom, we respect those who disagree with us. We are working to bring more people to our movement and to win hearts and minds. Now, as I mentioned earlier, our core values are the same as they have been for five years. After all, a core value is not a core value if it's changing. Fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets have been, are, and will continue to be our core values. But we've changed the wording and the order of those three core values. Now we've enhanced the message around our principles, personalizing and defining our core values more simply and more clearly. We are talking about what we are for and where we want to see the country go. We stand for personal freedom and economic freedom and foresee a debt-free future. So personal freedom, that, that's really the constitutional issue and the biggest one overall. Economic freedom is the free market issue. And of course, a debt-free future, that's fiscal responsibility. So why the need to enhance the message of our core values? Well, because we're looking ahead. We're not concentrating on what has been. It's the future that concerns us. And it's a future we want to help shape. So here's the key to our personal freedom principle. We support personal freedom so all Americans can live life the way they want as long as it does not harm others or infringe on another's rights. Now remember, you can see all this phraseology on our website, teapartypatriots.org. Now, you and I know that the Constitution secures personal freedom. As we've talked to people, though, we realize that most, of, most people don't know what's in that document. Yet when we talk the talk in a different way and highlight what personal freedom is, most people are going to understand exactly what we mean. Now, let me show you some of the polling uh, that we saw with Americans in relation to freedom, personal freedom. Now, here's a position contrast. Between, uh, based on privacy. The blue there is people who are willing to give up some freedoms uh, in order to have security. And the red are those who are, say it's not worth giving up basic rights in order to have security. You'll see the average American pe person believes that freedom is more important 
than security or more government services uh, or, or uh, a less limited government, I should say. Another point, having the IRS use tax codes to limit free speech of tax-exempt political organizations is a particular ideology. Most people, 63% of the American people said that would be a bad idea to have the IRS limit free speech. So they believe personal freedom should certainly come uh, above that. And you'll see even uh, liberals and, and, uh, and conservatives alike both believe that that would be a bad idea. Another position contrast, executive order. The blue there states that, uh, indicates that the president should be able to go around Congress and issue whatever executive order or decision he'd like. The red indicates those who disagree with that and believe that the president should never go around Congress or go around the Constitution. And so you'll see the average American people, 75% indicated that they would believe that the president should never go around. Uh, even liberals and moderates, again, alike, uh, as well as conservatives, Democrats, independents, all of them, an overwhelming majority. Now, here's a great uh, result that, that I was very happy to see, especially since my love is in the Constitution and, and the Founding Fathers principles of liberty. And we often hear many people talk about how, oh, it's just an old, outdated document and nobody cares about it anymore. Well, when the, the question was asked, is the Constitution a timeless document or an old, outdated document? There in the blue, you'll see those are the responses for those who said that it was a timeless document. Eighty-three percent of the American people said that it was a timeless document. Seventy-two percent of liberals. Ninety-one percent of conservatives. 86% of the independents, you'll see, overwhelming majority uh, still believe that the document is a timeless document. Now our next core value, economic freedom. We stand for economic freedom, which means a growing economy with reduced tax rates and reduced government spending so we all have a chance to earn more money and businesses can hire more people. Now this is a very personal principle. Many hardworking, well-qualified people have been trying as hard as they can to find jobs. They aren't lazy. They don't sit on the couch every day looking for a handout. They want a job. And they totally understand the connection that we're trying to make here. By reducing tax rates and reducing government spending, the economy will grow. And that leads the people to earn more money and businesses to hire more people. It's a principle that resonates across all kinds of dividing lines, political, personal, and economic. So, for example, let's take a look at that. <clears throat> With the question that was posed, our economy isn't growing as fast as it should, and not enough jobs are being created because our government is spending too much on the welfare state and not enough to curb deficits and the debt, which limits economic freedom. So the majority of people agree with that statement. <laughs> Excuse me. You'll see that the only two groups that, uh, or three groups that disagree with it are liberals, moderates, and Democrats. Now you'll find something interesting, and I want you to start paying attention to the verbiage here. What's interesting is they were asked, or they were presented with this, this situation of government spending too much on a welfare state. You'll notice that there's key words that immediately put people's defenses up. And so let's take a look at, at a restatement of essentially the same thing. When government, when the government cuts spending, it's good for my family and the economy because we will have more money in our pockets and businesses will have more money to hire new employees. Now you'll notice that liberals and Democrats still have a majority there that disagree with that, but that majority has gone down significantly and it has changed among moderates as well. So simply by taking some of those buzzwords out, like welfare or Obamacare or things like that, when you're talking to the general public, um, that, will be, that will be helpful. Now, there definitely is a proper time and a place to use uh, words like that so that people understand exactly what you're saying. But when we're talking to the general public, uh, it definitely matters, the words that we use. Growing the economy. Should we cut spending or raise taxes? A majority in every single category said we should cut spending rather than raise taxes. 
definitely an issue that uh, that we can we can win on. Then the question was posed: An organization? Would you agree with an organization that stood for economic freedom, which means growing the economy so we all have a chance to earn more money and reduce some tax rates to stimulate economic growth? By far, a majority said that they would be more likely to support an organization that agreed with that. Now, essentially, that's the core value that we expressed already, economic freedom. And that's similar verbiage to what we're using. The last core value, a debt-free future. We support a debt-free future because it is only fair and right to pay the debt we have incurred so our children and grandchildren are not stuck with our bills. People agree that getting rid of the national debt should be our priority. We understand the $17 trillion debt is real money that must be paid eventually. It's why we get so upset about things like bailouts, higher debt ceilings, and the debt-ridden federal budgets. But neither party has the guts to stop the overspending. Now, if you recall, the Tea Party movement over five years ago began primarily because of this debt issue, the bailouts that uh, President Bush had put in place, and as soon as President Obama got in, uh, into office, he kept the exact same policies with those bailouts, and that's really got fired. Was what fired people up, and so it's, a, it's an issue that the American people are very concerned about. Let's take a look at some slides. If we don't tackle the problem of our national debt, our children and grandchildren will be faced with a crumbling economy that will not offer good jobs or good economy or good opportunity. So again, overwhelming majority agreed with that statement. The next slide. I would be willing to take a smaller percent, a 1% cut in my government services if I knew that it would result in a balanced federal budget in less than 10 years. Again, by far a majority agrees with that. They'd be willing to take a 1% cut in government services if it meant balancing the budget in less than 10 years. That's a winning issue. Uh, essentially, that's the penny plan. Uh, and the penny plan in some areas could be presented as the penny plan, in other areas just simply a 1% cut. Now, as Jenny Beth mentioned, I'm from Arizona. And a few years ago, uh, Governor Brewer pushed through a one-cent sales tax uh, for education and public safety. And uh, the way that they sold that sales tax increase is to say it's only a penny out of every dollar. How can you uh, reject a penny out of every dollar for better education, better public safety? Well, the same message can be used here. All we're asking for is a one penny, one penny out of every dollar to be cut. And so the American people like that. The next uh, polling question, we don't have a large debt because we tax too little. We have a large debt because we spend too much. 75% of the American people agree with that. Even 57% of liberals agree that we have a large debt because we spend too much, not because we tax too little. Again, the question, would you support an organization that stands for a debt-free future because it is only fair and right to pay the debt we have incurred so our children and grandchildren are not stuck with our bills? 71% said they would be more likely to support an organization that believed that. 55% of liberals, 69% of uh, independents, 62% of, of moderates. It's a winning message that the Tea Party has had all along that we want to eliminate the deficit, stop the deficit spending. The next question, let the government continue to increase the U.S. national debt, which is already over $17 trillion, which means that every single American citizen's share of the national debt today is more than $50,000. Overwhelming majority said this is a bad idea to let the government continue to increase the national debt. 79% of the American people, bad idea. 62% liberals said it's a bad idea. 79% of independents. The national debt is just a number, and the government does not really have to pay it back. Now, this question was another question that, that uh, really was uplifting when we saw the results. 
because quite often it's difficult to believe that people can really wrap their brain around seventeen trillion dollars. And so, is it getting to the point that because it's so high, people don't care about the debt anymore? Um, that's just not the case. Eighty-three percent of the people say that they disagree with the fact that it's just a number and that the government doesn't really have to pay it back. Um, Seventy-eight percent of liberals, eighty-five percent of independents, ninety-one percent of Tea Party favorites. Now, there's one other uh, uh, slide I want to show you here regarding uh, another issue, and that these are other issues are the most important issues facing the United, uh, the U.S. The American people said that the economy was the number one issue. Uh, overwhelmingly, they said the economy. The next issue, unemployment and jobs, essentially part of the economy. And the next issue, of course, is health care and insurance, which is the high rising uh, cost of health insurance and, and health care. And so again, the economy, budget and deficit is next. So the economy is, is, is definitely a winning issue. Again, it's the issue that the Tea Party basically started with. And uh, so it's an issue we can continue to, uh, to move forward with. Now you'll notice toward the bottom there, the whole 99% versus the 1%, that has not really resonated much with the American people. Um, it's something that, that uh, they're not too terribly interested in. Now as our polling demonstrates, everyday Americans agree with us on the issues and our values. They know that there's something wrong, especially with a $17 trillion debt and 1,000-page bills passing out of Congress without our elected representatives even reading the bills. But everyday Americans don't really feel like it's a crisis yet. So if we talk in terms of doomsday, that's not going to resonate. What they're looking for are solutions, solutions to problems that they know exist. Americans are, are an optimistic people. With our core principles and vision and solutions, we offer opportunities for all Americans to join us. When we spread the message far and wide, we will have family, friends, neighbors, and even our opposition enthusiastically saying one to another, pursue your American dream. It's a great message that, that works. And there's uh, on, that, on our website where I showed you where those videos were, on the trainings uh, page. There's a, also a couple of other videos there, some testimonials of some folks that have been using it and have had great success with it. Now, the question is, how do we really get in there and, and speak that language and do it in everyday conversation? We've give, given you some great phrases, and some, there's uh, many other phrases there on our website you'll see. Uh, the core issues has some great information on different issues and how to present that. Um, but we need to really learn, in addition to these phrases, we need to learn how to speak the language of liberty, liberty naturally and not just memorizing words and phrases. And so now let's talk a little bit more about speaking the language of liberty. How can we take this new message to make it effective? We can do it by learning how to speak the language of liberty. And the way that we can do that is the same way that Jefferson did, by continuing to learn it and speak it and make it a part of his life. Remember the quote that I gave you, neither aiming at originality of principle or sentiment, nor yet copied from any particular and previous writing, it was intended, he's talking about the Declaration of Independence, to be an expression of the American mind and to give that to that expression the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. Now I want you to keep those things in mind as we go through talking about uh, speaking the language of liberty. To capture the expression of the American mind and to do so in a proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. Now there's three things, three important things that I need, I think we need to do to learn to speak the language of liberty. The first one is to speak with both your heart and your mind. The second, immerse yourself in the principles of liberty. And the third, Speak the language of liberty, not the language of captivity. Be positive, optimistic, and forward-thinking. The first step, speak with both your heart and with your mind. Now, the language of liberty is more than just the words we use. It's the combination and context with which we use them. Let me show you a couple of slides that 
that uh, I held off. First of all, again, we want to choose the right words. Do so in the proper tone and spirit called for by the occasion. So one slide I didn't show you earlier was the question as to whether or not we should replace Obamacare with a health care system that offers real choices and takes government out of health care businesses. Most people said that was a good idea. But you'll notice liberals and Democrats said that would be a bad idea. But watch what happens when we take out some of the phrases like Obamacare. Would you agree with an organization that stands for health care freedom for all Americans so we can choose our own doctor, health insurance plans, without penalty from government if we do not choose items we think we do not need? At that point, 41% of liberals and 45% of Democrats said that they would be more likely to support an organization. We left out that word Obamacare. Again, there are times and places to use words and phrases. There's a time and place to use the term Obamacare. But if we're talking to our friends and neighbors and we're trying to, to help people understand really what our principles are, our principles aren't about eliminating Obamacare. Our principles are for health care freedom for all Americans. And so it's important that, uh, that we choose the right, right words that's the proper spirit and tone called for by the occasion, as Jefferson said. Now, it's not enough to pontificate on the logic of, of a principle or its logical application of an issue. For most, that's exactly how it's going to be viewed, as people are just going to look at, look at you as if you're just pontificating. But it also doesn't suffice to seemingly lose all reason in a passionate and emotional rampage. Neither approach will convince or inspire and will most likely not move another for action. For example, we could go on some rant about welfare and how the poor are lazy and they need to get back to work or how they're leeching off the system. While that might be a logical approach, it does not stir passions in another, other than the thought that they might think that you're just cold and heartless. I'm sure that most of you have compassion for others, but this approach certainly doesn't does not indicate that. So I want you to consider this quote from Benjamin Franklin, where he said, I am for doing good to the poor but I differ in the opinion of the means. I think the best way of doing good to the poor is not making them easy in poverty, but leading or driving them out of it. In my youth, I traveled much, and I observed in different countries that the more public provisions were made for the poor, the less they provided for themselves, and of course became poorer. And on the contrary, the less was done for them, the more they did for themselves, and the richer they became. Now, Franklin's approach actually increases in logic, but it also satisfies the emotion as well. In addition, he leaves no doubt that he wants what's best for the poor. He makes it clear. He doesn't want them to be poorer. He wants them to be richer. And here's what I've discovered through my travels, what will make them richer. So he puts a personal experience into it about his travels, and he brings logic and reason into it and, and helps them connect uh, to it both logically and emotionally. Now, another way to stir the heart and mind is to allow others to mentally engage in your message. Use statements that allow the listener to plug themselves, their own knowledge, and their own imagination into your statements. For example, fiscal responsibility, constitutionally limited government, and free markets are very logical, but provide no opportunity for the listener to personalize them, whereas personal freedom, economic freedom and a debt-free future allows them to insert their own vision of what that means and how it affects them. Pursue your American dream is a perfect example of a language of liberty phrase that immediately results in the desired effect. To most people on both the right and on the left, that phrase means the freedom to pursue my own course of life through hard work and the right to keep what I earn as a result of my efforts. Now, doesn't that truly represent what we are trying to teach in its simplest form? Yet we didn't have to say all that. We just simply said, pursue your American dream. Now, the second step is to immerse yourself in the principles of liberty. Do as Jefferson did. Study the principles. Live the principles. Teach the principles. And implement the principles. If you do, you will soon be able to speak the language of liberty. 
as you read it and gain a deeper understanding of the principles of liberty, you then want to live them, not just in relation to your government, but in your everyday life. You'll find that the principles for good government can apply just as well to individual and family governance as it does to local, state, and federal government. So exercise good government in your own life. Truly exercise your unalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as you read and live the principles, teach them. Always teach. The best way to retain what you have learned is to immediately teach it. Get so that the moment you learn something, you are restless until you have imparted what you have learned to another. Finally, implement the principles. Now, you will have already begun to do this as you have lived them, but now strive to implement them into your community, your state, and your country. And then the third and last step, speak the language of liberty, not the language of captivity. Be positive, optimistic, and forward-thinking. Now, what exactly does it mean, speak the language of liberty and not the language of captivity? What are the characteristics of the language of liberty? The characteristics of the language of liberty are selflessness, positive, they're optimistic, they're forward-thinking, it's hopeful, it's enlightening, it's empowering, it's enabling, it has vision, it's motivating, it's protecting, it's maintaining, it's perpetuating, defending, protecting, informing, uniting, it's very inclusive, all those things. Now, in contrast, what are the characteristics of the language of captivity? The language of captivity is contrarian, it's contention, destruction, it's very limiting, it's oppressive, it's fearful, scary, doomsday-ish, it's suppression, subjugation, attack, selfish attacks, manipulative, dividing, uh, war, conflict, those are all language of, of captivity. So you want to avoid having this spirit of captivity. In fact, a great example is the, de is the Declaration of Independence. The majority of the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances. Now that list of grievances uh, about what a tyrant has been doing to mankind should hang a dark cloud over that document. But yet those first two paragraphs and the conclusion, Jefferson's able to speak the language of liberty so clearly that not only is there not a dark cloud over the document, but that document gives great hope to not only America, but for all mankind. That is a great example of the language of liberty, where it's positive, optimistic, and forward thinking. Now consider the phrases, a couple of phrases that you might, you might want to consider, liberty versus captivity. For example, fight, battle, war. Now when we think about those things, we think about a couple of politicians that are just simply contending about this issue or that issue. That's, what, that's the way we look at it when we're, when we're looking at politics. But when others are looking at it, they literally are thinking about fighting, battling, and war. Most people don't like that. Most people don't want to be recruited to a fight. And so rather than using terms of fighting and battling and come join the war, we want to use terms that protect, win, or bring peace. Because really that's what our actions do. The, the principles of liberty will bring freedom, peace, and prosperity to this nation as they have in the past and will continue to do in the future. So it's much easier, uh, rather than asking people to join us in fighting for your freedom, that's a daunting task for most people, and they're not quite sure how to go about doing that. So instead of joining us in fighting for your freedom, we want people to join us in winning your freedom. That's a, a good example. Fighting is, it, it can be an, uh, a language of captivity, whereas winning is definitely a language of liberty. And so many more people are going to want to join us in winning our freedom than they will in fighting for our freedom. Language of liberty versus language of captivity. Consider these phrases. We hold these truths. Consider how uniting and unifying these phrases are. We hold these truths. All men are created equal. Of course, this includes women, right? All mankind are created equal. We all have our separate and equal station, right? Which the laws of nature and nature's God give us. 
we the people. See how inclusive the founders are including in these statements? Or how about this one? A person shall be eligible to the office of president. Now this is something that most people don't realize. You can ask them, uh, does the Constitution mention women? Most people will say, well, no, it doesn't mention women. They couldn't vote and all those things. Who else doesn't the Constitution mention? Well, who else is there? There's men. And so it does not mention men either. It says a person shall be eligible to the office of president. Or it says a person shall be 25 years in order to be a representative. The person shall be. Uh, and so you see how inclusive the founders were? Now, while these statements were all, are all true in principle, they were not the reality of the day in 1776, 1787. Slavery, feudal law, no women in office or, or women couldn't vote. That was the reality of their time. But these statements were so forward thinking and that they were so optimistic that these types of statements and the, and the documents that they were in helped to free the slaves, establish a republican form of government, and, and ended up bringing uh, the women's right to vote and hold an office, and they built a free society like the world has never known. Now we also need to learn how to, uh, in order to truly speak the language of liberty, we must understand the importance of being a self-governing people. We must be willing to defend self-governance even in behalf of our political foes. So again, we don't want to speak the language of captivity even when we're talking about our political foes. We want freedom and liberty for everybody regardless. Here's a quote from Jefferson that's great. If there be any among us who wish to dissolve this union or to change its republican form, let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety with which error of opinion may be tolerated, where reason is left free to combat it. So here Jefferson is talking about even if people want are talking about destroying our union, or perhaps talking about fundamentally changing our nation. We should let them stand undisturbed as monuments of the safety uh, of freedom of speech and the great freedoms that we have. He does mention freedom, uh, reason needs to be left free to combat it. So we've got to have freedom of speech. But see, if we, did, if we get rid of freedom of speech so that our opposition can't speak, then that means we can't speak either, and that will bring oppression to everyone. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, that we want opposition to be able to just say whatever they want and we just ignore them. By all means, reason needs to be left free to combat it. So we need to be able to express our views as well. We just need to avoid any tendency to want to take away the freedom of our opposition. We want freedom for all, not just uh, for ourselves. Consider these uh, further quotes from Jefferson. I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. This is the true corrective of abuses of constitutional power. So again, Jefferson talking about if we think that others aren't enlightened enough to exercise their control or to vote correctly or whatever, the remedy isn't to take those freedoms from them, but to educate them. We never have the right to take freedoms from anybody, regardless of how informed or uninformed they are. Jefferson then says, the involvement of people themselves on one side of government has had a great effect on the opinion here. I am persuaded myself that the good sense of the people will always be found to be the best army. They may be led astray for a moment, but will soon correct themselves. The people are the only censors of their government, and even in their errors, they will tend to keep these to the true principles of their institution. So Jefferson's saying that even if some people are wrong about what they're trying to espouse, just the fact that they're standing up uh, and being the censor of the government will have a positive uh, uh, result in our republic. He then goes on to say, to punish these errors too severely would be to suppress the only safeguard of the public liberty. The way to prevent these irregular interpositions of the people is to give them full information of their affairs. The basis of our government is being the opinion of the people. The very first object should be to keep that right. So again, freedom for all. 
And here's what Jefferson says if we ever try to take freedom away from anybody. He says, cherish therefore the spirit of our people and keep alive their attention. And do not be too severe upon their errors, but reclaim them by enlightening them. If once they become inattentive or inactive to the public affairs, you and I and Congress and assemblies, judges and governors shall all become wolves. I love how Jefferson includes himself in that. He knows that he's not immune to becoming a wolf in the event that, he, that the people uh, were ever fail, ever failed to be free. Now, as you study the words of the founders, you'll see this next uh, point with this with this speaking the language of liberty. You've got to be positive, optimistic, and forward-thinking. You'll discover as you study the the words of the founders and other other philosophers of liberty, you'll notice one common thread that 90% of their words are very positive, optimistic, and forward-thinking. If you go back and read a, the list of grievances in the Declaration of Independence, they, they're very, very uh, depressing and clouded. And like I mentioned earlier, if, if, once you read the whole document, the Declaration of Independence, it is positive, optimistic, and forward-thinking and gives a bright future not just for America, but for all mankind. The words of fear, collapse, conspiracy, the end, and other, others, it all brings despair and unhappiness. That's not what America is made of. John Adams said, fear is the foundation of most governments, but it is so sordid and brutal a passion, and it renders men in whose breasts it, will, it predominates so stupid and miserable. So fear is not uh, the direction we want to go. Instead, he said, I always consider the settlement of America with reverence and wonder as the opening of a grand scene in design and providence for the illumination of the ignorant and the emancipation of the slavish part of mankind all over the earth. You see the difference there between the fear statement and this great uh, optimistic, positive, forward-thinking statement. Our belief in a self-governing people capable of embracing their unalienable rights is the true positive opinion of mankind. And it's very contrary to the dim view that, that mankind cannot govern themselves, but must be controlled by government. We are not the anti-believers that our distractors accuse us of. We're not anti-progress. We're not anti-government. Nothing is further from the truth. Therefore, avoid using anti-language. We do not need to say that we're anti-socialized medicine. We can simply say that we are for health care freedom. We believe in freedom and that freedom has progressed mankind further than any system of control. We are not anti-government, but rather we are the true lovers of government. We love the very well-defined government that operates under specific parameters and adheres to the rule of law, not a government by the whims of men, which really is no government at all. At all. We believe in the rule of the majority and laws that, project, that protect the minority. We do not believe in the doctrine of the divine right of kings or that some elite class is somehow born with the privilege of governing others, even without their consent. A doctrine that implies that God made mankind to be oppressive and plundered. We believe all people are equal under the law, regardless of title and bloodline. Freedom progresses mankind forward better than any other system. The language of liberty speaks of the future. It speaks of what mankind may become. For example, or for instance, the language of liberty does not just secure property, but it pursues happiness. Americans like to move forward. They like to shoot for the stars. We must be mindful of words that place us uh, in the past. When you or I say that we want to restore the Constitution or return to the principles of the founders, we know that we mean the reinstitution of principles that will allow us to be free and continue to move mankind forward. But that's not necessarily how every American hears it. Jefferson said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. When they hear restore or go back, they hear the bad with the good. Sure, they might hear freedom and liberty, but they also hear slavery, prohibiting women's votes, and other founder-bashing rhetoric. We don't need to cite the founders to speak the language of liberty. There is certainly a time and a place where connecting back to our ancestors is necessary. But we do not need to cite the founders when we speak the language of liberty. It's not the founders' language. It's the language of all mankind. 
Jefferson did not cite Locke in the news numerous times he spoke the language of liberty. Consider Madison's statements. Is it not the glory of the people of America that whilst they have paid a decent regard to the opinions of former times, they have not suffered a blind veneration for antiquity, for custom, or for names to overrule the suggestions of their own good sense, the knowledge of their own situation, and the lessons of their own experience? While we certainly should pay decent regard to their opinions, we should not suffer a blind veneration to the founders to overrule our knowledge and our experience. Mastering the ability to speak the language of liberty will not be by parroting the words of the founders, but by learning it through your own good sense, your own knowledge of your own situation, and lessons from your own experiences. Now don't misunderstand me. Those of you who know me know I love the founders. I deep, I'm deeply indebted to their discoveries and their sacrifices. But the language of liberty does not need to be credited to them in every instance to pay them the honor that they deserve. The language of liberty will stand on its own. After all, the language of liberty is self-evident. It's beyond reasonable dispute and therefore needs no additional support. If we are to be effective in spreading the message of freedom, we must learn to speak the language of liberty. You can do this by speaking with both your heart and with your mind, immersing yourself in the principles of liberty. And for those of you who have not read it, The 5,000 Year Leap is the best book to jump in there and learn the principles of liberty. It's very concise, easy to read, but it's very comprehensive on the principles of liberty. And the third thing, speak the language of liberty, not the language of captivity. Be positive, optimistic, and forward-thinking. As we speak the language of liberty, we will once again give rise to the light of liberty in the midst of these most troubling times. As Jefferson said, enlighten the people, and tyranny and oppression will vanish like evil spirits at the dawn of day. Our forebears understood the promise of liberty. They lived and they died for it. It is their voices that cry from the dust for us to embrace our duty and carry on their great work. Now, go forth and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. So I hope this message of speaking the language of liberty has been helpful uh, for you. As I mentioned, uh, the details on the language that Tea Party Patriots is using uh, and those details that can help you can be found on our website, teapartypatriots.org. And um, those videos on the training page will go into more detail about that language uh, that Tea Party Patriots is using. So with that, uh, Shelby, I think uh, we want to open up to a couple of questions, and then, then we can close out. Sure. Let's go ahead and uh, let everybody know uh, how you can ask a question. We have two ways you can do that. Uh, the first would be to raise your hand. We already have a couple of people who have done that. I'm going to lower all of the hands so we can make sure that the people who want to ask the questions will be able to. The first way you can do that is to uh, click a little icon on the webinar software. It's going to be an icon of a little hand. If you click that, it will let us know that you have a question that you'd like to ask. Or you can type your question in the question log and we will be able to either read it, read it a lot on air or enter it in the question log. Or if we can't uh, find an answer for you immediately, we'll see what we can do about getting you that answer later. Um, so I have put down all the hands. If you do have a question, you can either click on the icon or write in the question log. And the first question will come from Joyce Stavely. Go ahead, Joyce. Hi, Bill. Um, Bill, I've, I've heard this um, you know this messaging before and I've done some reading on it and I I believe what you're saying is true and that it will work my problem is that it's it it's not as easy to use in practice as it would seem when you present it so I'm wondering if you have some very easy tricks for people that are trying to use the language of liberty but maybe haven't been practicing it that long is there, a, is there something you can start out with, some little rule of thumb that might head you in the right direction while you're trying to think of the proper words to use? 
Yeah, it, 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 the best thing to do is, is practice. First, immerse yourself in it in, in your own reading and study and what you're watching. See, one of the problems that I think we have as politically active people is we get so involved in listening to to all the media, to, to Fox News, MSNBC, all the talking heads, and, and, and we get so hung up in the political bantering that when we go out and talk to our friends, we start sounding like that political bantering. And among some friends, that's great. We know the friends that that works fine with. But among others, we know that that just turns them off. They're not, they, they are not interested in, in listening to that. And so we, we need to do more than just watch the talking heads. We, we've got to uh, immerse ourselves in things that are a little bit more inspiring and positive. Um, and so one thing you can do if you want just, just in general, um, speaking the language of liberty, again, get like the 5,000 year leap book and start reading through it. And as you get to one principle, read through that principle a couple of times and then make it a point over the next week or so to try to teach somebody about that principle or bring it up in everyday conversation and just start practicing with that language. Uh, if you want to get very specific on say healthcare, then you can jump on Tea Party Patriots website, read over some of the, the issues there on healthcare and then uh, on our on our core issues page, and then and then pick some some things that you want to make it a point to bring up in everyday conversation as well. So so don't just try to automatically speak the language of liberty in, in everything you do and say. Identify a specific principle or a specific issue or topic, and make it a point to bring it up in a few conversations throughout you know the, the next week or whatever. Um, so really, that's the best way is. Try to try to not be totally bombarded with all the negative stuff. Get some more positive stuff, and then just simply get out there and practice it. Does that make sense? Um, yes, I believe so. Um, once again, if you do have a question, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, let me take a quick peek at the question log. And we are having those questions answered by Kevin Mooneyham. At this time, I do not have any more hands up. You are using a microphone and speakers and um, listening via computer. Um, I recommend that you uh, make sure that your microphone is functional uh, as well as your speakers. Otherwise, we won't be able to hear you. So we'll go to Pat. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I had uh, a question that you thought about uh, in your local groups getting together to practice this with like-minded individuals. Um, you know, small groups can can interact and, and give feedback to each other. Um, is that something that you know the Tea Party Patriots can encourage and and, and you know try and uh, carry forward? Yeah, that's that's a great point, and certainly those of you who are on and and just heard that. I mean, certainly do it in your own groups and do some. Sometimes role playing can be a little bit weird, a little bit awkward, and so you want to, you know, try it a little bit and see if it works well. I, I find that the best thing to do to be the most natural with it is again to just get out, get out there among friends and family, and and just start, just start talking the talk and start trying to be. Uh, as you start thinking about what you're doing, you're going to start, you're going to realize how. Perhaps you've been too negative in an area, and you need to be more positive, or or you're just not being inspiring, and you know. So, but definitely doing it in your uh, in your local groups would be a great idea. Tea Party Patriots doesn't have anything specific uh, that that we've done to where we've allowed people to practice that, but we are continuing to develop this speaking the language of liberty, and perhaps. Um, sometime in the future we can have some exercises or something that can that can help you. In, in doing that in your everyday life. All right, next we will go to Gary Mitchell. Go ahead, Gary. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I have a comment. I'd just like to say thank you for doing this, um, something that's really needed. I think the most important thing that we can do is communicate, and we need, we need to educate people. And, uh, sec and uh, doing the work that you did to find out what people actually hear when you say certain things, that's that's extremely important, and, this, and spreading it to us is great. Um, then, um, secondly, and I, you may have already mentioned it, but uh, it, 
these uh, this um, presentation that you used is that also on the website? Uh, the exact presentation that I just went through is not on the website, but the videos on the uh, training page. Uh, there's video number two is Jenny Beth presenting the new the new phrases with the procedure American dream and the three core values, and then video number eight goes into detail uh, about the polling that was done and and the methodology and things like that. Okay, so, that's super. Yeah. So a good chunk of it is there. In fact, it goes into more detail in those two videos from what I did. But the other segment that I did, Speaking the Language of Liberty, is not on the website at this time, no. But, but we will be recording this webinar uh, and making it available. OK, great. Thanks. All right. Next, we are going to go to Christina Rolston. Go ahead, Christina. All right, Christina, we're not able to hear you. You may want to double check your microphone and make sure that it is functional. And I'll go ahead and put your hand down. If you do get that fixed, go ahead and raise your hand again, and we'll be able to get back to you. Let's see. Go ahead, Christina. Sorry, we're still not able to hear you. Uh, next, we'll go back to Pat Carswell. Go ahead, Pat. Yeah, I had a question. Could you uh, review the how to get to the videos on the web page again? Yeah, so on the on the home page, tpartypatriots.org, there's a on the top there's a, a link that's take action, and then it'll pop down into some other options, and you'll see resources, and that's going to bring you to a page that I think I think it's like the third or fourth. Um, paragraph down is training. So you'll click on training and then that brings you to the training page and as you scroll down there's like nine videos um, and all those videos have to do with messaging. There's some that, that talk about how to write, there's some that talk about um, how to handle the media and how to interview and things like that. Uh, but the two videos uh, that I mentioned here are also on that page. So take action, Resources, training. Those are the three three uh, links you're going to click. All right, Bill. We do have a few more questions from the question log. Uh, John Miller wants to know. Uh, he says, "Can you speak on applying this on Twitter? I find Twitter is a very relevant media we can have an impact in." Well, so Twitter's kind of is a great. Um, resource, where the challenge is, is refining things and making them as simple and concise as possible. Um, and so I don't have any specific tip or pointer on Twitter other than just keep the language, again, positive, optimistic, forward thinking, very freedom uh, oriented. Uh, and don't talk about what we're against, talk about what we're for. Don't talk about um, you know the the battle words are are the ones that uh, the the general public don't like. Now, I do want to clarify. I didn't mention when I was in that section there the presentation that that when you are among people who who are politically active, they don't mind the battle words, the fighting, and the you know let's fight, let's battle, let's go. Um, but the general public does not like that, and so keep that in mind when you're sending out a, a tweet or or a Facebook post. You might think that only your political friends are seeing it, but but remember, it, so many more people are seeing it, and so just keep that in mind when you're talking to the uh, regarding the general public that we want to keep things very positive, very solution oriented. All right, um, we will have. I'm checking the question log and the hands up. We at this time do not have any more hands up. 